the so-called progressive elites in the West have they've always had this kind of tension when it comes to Jewish people. So they, over the past few decades, they they've liked the image of the Jew as victim, right? Hol- Holocaust films are very very popular. They love to watch them. They get a moral kick. But when they see the image of a Jew who is a 19 year old or 20 year old man or woman, fit as a fiddle, with guns absolutely determined to defend their nation and their people from the attacks of anti-Semites. They and don't quite like good that. looking as well, Brendan. We're, we're quite You're right. this generation, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> attractive people, um, tanned, you know, and willing to go to war. Yeah. They don't like that. They don't like that one bit. After the pogrom, what now for Israel and the Jewish diaspora? What now for Western civilization, for that matter? The swirling dust of conflict has brought with it seismic changes to the world we're living in. And yet, amid Israel's fight on seven fronts, Brendan O'Neill's coherent, methodic analysis explains the world we're witnessing around us. Brendan's not on X. You'll only find Burnt Oak Boy, as he's known on Instagram, because he says the rest of social media is far too rough and ugly for him, and it's where since October the 7th, 2023, he's been ever-present with stout, sometimes uncensored defences of the State of Israel. You've also seen him write for Spiked Online, his publication, and on TV and radio. But he's no Johnny-come-lately, he's not jumped on an Israel bandwagon. In our first interview here on Johnny Gould's Jewish State in 2020, Brendan compared the Jewish and non-Jewish people's takeaways from the Second World War, while Europeans declared that to end all wars we needed happy, clappy borders, as he put it, ergo none really. Jews, on the other hand, he said, learnt that secure borders were absolutely essential to our survival. How right he's proved to be. Scroll back to episode 51 for a gripping first interview between us during those Brexit and Covid years. But right now, recorded at this most poignant date in our recent history, it's always a pleasure to spend time with Brendan O'Neill. Brendan O'Neill. On this day of all days, our discussion takes place on the first anniversary of October the 7th. Brendan O'Neill, for the second time, welcome to Johnny Gould's Jewish State. Thank you, Johnny. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. And a pleasure again to have you on the show. Many congratulations on After the Pogrom. It's a wonderful book, and for every Jewish person, it's it's more than a book. It, it's a hope. It's a heartfelt reminder that there remain good people in the world who've got our backs, willing to speak up in this most frightening of times. The rug has been pulled from under us, it seems. It does feel like that, doesn't it? For uh, lots of the, my Jewish friends and Jewish people I've met over the past year have said the same thing. They feel like they've been abandoned. You know, they feel like they've been abandoned by people who said they were anti-racist, people who said they were anti-fascist, people who described themselves as progressive. It seems that those kinds of people have turned their backs on Jews over the past year, since the 7th of October pogrom a year ago. And yeah, Jews are feeling pretty lonely. So one of the my great privileges of my working life is that over the past year I've been able to do um, talks at synagogues and I've done a couple of talks in in Jewish people's homes and I've been invited to talk to various communities and I've been able to say to them look some of us have your back and some of us recognize the seriousness of what happened on 7th of October and the seriousness of the fallout which was a rise in anti-semitism across Europe and we're not going to take it and we're going to argue back against it just as you guys are. So, yeah, it does feel like the Jewish community is a lonely community at the moment. And I think the more solidarity we can have, the better. Amen. Now, I know th- well that you're not a late arrival into fervent support for Israel. This is not a Damascene conversion. You've been a supporter of the idea of a Jewish state for a long time. So what drives your clarity on Israel? Um, It's a good question. You know, I think it's been it's I think it's my clarity to such an extent that I have clarity. I think sometimes I can be as confused as everyone else. But 
On this issue, I think my clarity has been growing for some time and taking shape for some time. You know, I am I'm an anti-imperialist at heart. Um, I was against the Iraq war. I didn't like the bombing of Libya in 2011. And uh, I'm, I'm generally wary of wars of intervention that I think are destructive and and um, will have dangerous consequences and so on. So I've been on so many anti-war marches over the past 25 years or so and rubbed shoulders with anti-war activists and made friends with them and so on. But over that time, I just recognized that when it came to Israel, there was a different atmosphere. Um, if you ever went on an anti-Israel protest, and I tended not to because I always found them really weird going back decades you know 25 years 30 years i always thought there was something weird about these demonstrations and they felt so different to the other ones that i had gone on the anti-iraq war demonstration the, the anti-israel ones always felt more visceral and uglier and they had a nasty undertone and and what was most striking is that they didn't seem to be calling for peace at all they seem to be calling for the destruction of the world's only Jewish state. You know, people would openly say, get rid of Israel, you know, wipe it off the map, give the land back to Hamas or some other Jew hating organization. So and we've seen a lot of that over the past year since 7th of October. We've seen open chance for the destruction of the Jewish nation. So there was always something about anti-Israel protests that left me cold. And over time, it really started to dawn on me for a couple of decades now, it started to dawn on me that there was nothing progressive or positive whatsoever about the hatred for Israel. I know that's how it often presents itself. It presents itself as this very forward-looking, progressive, caring, anti-racist point of view, but it's none of those things. None of those things at all. It's very, in my mind, it's it's regressive, it's it's guttural, it's visceral, as I was saying, and, and it contains more than a few flashes of racism you know there is a the hostility to the jewish state the myopic swirling hostility to the jewish state very easily crosses the line into hostility to the jewish people to such an extent that i think those things are virtually indistinguishable now so over time i just started to question anti-israel sentiment and what was motivating it and i think through that i started to realize quite some time ago that actually not only was it wrong to march in the streets and call for Israel's destruction, of course, but in fact that one should do the precise opposite and take a stand for the right of Israel to exist, for the right of Israel to flourish, for the right of Jews to have their own homeland just as other peoples have their own homeland, and for the right of these people to stand up against the anti-Semitic armies that threaten them and that surround them. So that's the position I'm now in. I find myself very much a pro-Israel person, and I defend Israel's right to fight against its enemies. Because, Brendan, we spoke about this in our first interview here on Johnny Gould's Jewish State, would you believe, December 2020, when wow. you declared, I know, I didn't desert the left, the left deserted me, referring to a time when the radical left was Israel's flag waver against a far right which was racist, the sort of skinheads and all that that went on in the 1980s. But broadly, that's no longer. Um, we find that there's a bit of a class distinction that some skinheads these days are pro-Israel, yeah. and it's the intellectual left that have become the anti-Jewish racists. What's, what's happened? It's so bizarre, isn't it? There really has been that a very dramatic switch around between uh, the the left and the right and you know if you go back to if you go really far back to the 60s and the 70s which i don't remember <laughs> i wasn't around then um i was around in the 70s but i was a baby um if you go back to that period it's really striking because um the left was the left was generally it started to change in the mid 70s after Munich and um, there were radical left wing militant left wing groups in Europe that started to align with Palestinians and started to become very anti-Semitic, especially in Germany. Um, but in the 60s, um, the left in the West tended to take the side of Israel. It tended to take the side of Israel in the 67 war, even in the Yom Kippur war a few years later. It was on the side of Israel and it saw Arab nationalism, what was referred to as Arab nationalism, as a pretty regressive force, uh, an imperious force that wanted to force the Jews out of their uh, historic homeland. And uh, the left 
could see quite clearly what was at stake. But that did start to change later on in the 1970s, and especially in the 80s and the 90s, when the left completely switched sides and started to become obsessed with the supposed evils of Israel and started to see Israel as the source not only of Palestinian ills, but all the world's ills. And they they developed this anti-Zionism, which to my mind was not that different from anti-Semitism. Only instead of blaming the Jewish people for everything that goes wrong, they were blaming the Jewish nation for everything that goes wrong. Um, and as a consequence of that, the left has become increasingly anti-Semitic. There are now sections of the radical left in particular, which sound very much like the far right used to sound. You know, they wring their hands over Jewish influence. They moan about Jewish privilege. They uh, have this deranged obsession with the Jewish state, uh, which they hate more than any other state on earth. So the left has taken the place of the far right. The far left is now the far right. And But what's more worrying for me is that even though being openly pro-Hamas and openly sniffy about Jews, even though that might still be a fairly fringe position on the internet and in left-wing circles and so on, I think it's inflamed by the more mainstream suspicion of Israel. And I think that's one of the most worrying developments over recent years. There is now in the mainstream media, including the BBC, including the liberal press like The Guardian, and in chattering class circles, there is now a hostility to Israel, which I think is irrational, and I think is quite hateful at times and quite bigoted. And I think that so-called respectable animus for Israel inflames the more unhinged animus for Israel that we see where people say, I love Hamas. So it, I think we have to tackle both sides. You know, the temptation is to tackle the fringe nutters first because they're so loony. But I do think we have to keep an eye on the mainstreaming of anti-Israel sentiment, which sadly is happening. Indeed, you've called uh, it currently the anti-imperialism of fools, just as it used to be called the socialism of fools, anti-Semitism. Yes. So the socialism of fools is a phrase that was invented by, I think, he, I think it was a German Marxist in the early 20th century, because he noticed that lots of radical leftists, lots of radical Marxists were going were going off the rails and they their anti-capitalism was morphing into anti-Semitism. So they weren't just against, you know, the wrongs and the injustices of capitalist society, but increasingly they were saying, well, it's all down to the Jews. They're pulling all the strings. They own all the banks. They're, they're the dark forces behind capitalist society. And this uh, Marxist referred to that as the socialism of fools, an idiotic form of socialism that was wrong, that was wicked and that, which could easily go off the rails and lead to pogroms and so on. And I think uh, he, he was absolutely right. And we've seen that socialism of fools come back to life over the past 10 years in Britain in particular, when Jeremy Corbyn took over the Labour Party. I think uh, there was an, uh, an influx of people with very dodgy views into the Labour Party. And I think that atmosphere could be described as the socialism of fools. But I think what we have now is also is the anti-imperialism of fools. Mm -hmm. So where the socialism of fools blamed Jews for the ills of capitalist society, the anti-imperialism of fools blames the Jewish state for the ills of the world. It depicts this one state, this tiny country, which which is very, very small and um, takes up a tiny amount of space in a land that is predominantly Arab or, or Persian. Um, they depict this one state as the worst state. Uh, you know, you openly see actual columnists referring to it as a genocidal state, a psychotic state, a lunatic state. You know, Owen Jones, uh, early on after 7th of October, he referred to uh, Israel's warring against Hamas as uniquely murderous, uh, as one of the essentially as one of the most murderous wars of all time, which is categorically untrue on every metric. It is untrue. Then you had people like Gary Lineker. I mentioned this in my book, Gary Lineker saying about the war in Gaza, this is one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. I'm sorry, but Gary Lineker is literally friends with Alistair Campbell. And Alistair Campbell, when he was spin doctor for Tony Blair, he bore a lot of responsibility for a war which on every measurement was infinitely worse than what's happening in Gaza, the Iraq war, in which vastly more people died, 
I, I personally think that war had no justification. I think it was wrong for us to do it and so on. Whereas this war in Gaza has every justification because Hamas attacked Israel. So there's this kind of irrational loathing for Israel in influential circles, which is utterly out of proportion to Israel's size, anything Israel has ever done, and anything that Israel represents. So it, it, there's a kind of um, boiling, burning, ugly hatred for Israel that I think, I make this point in the book, I think it exists outside the realm of normal politics, and in fact is fueled by bigotry, envy, anti-civilizational trends, you know, wokeness, whatever we want to call it. I think there's a real uh, kind of irrational hostility to Israel that cannot be explained in the language of anti-imperialism of old or the language of politics of old. Indeed. I've just pitched, Gary Lineker, an idea for, for a podcast. Uh, the rest is tedious. Um, <laughs> perhaps you can join me in on that as a yeah. double header. <laughs> um, now, your book is rich in quotes, agenda setting, may I say, wow. chapters laid out in an order of the many issues that have reared their ugly heads since October the 7th, 2023. Um, well, let's let's continue with the celebrations which occurred in the UK and around the world that very evening. This was more than a spike in hate crime. It was a continuation of the pogrom. It was the globalization of the 7th of October. It was the internationalization of the Hamas ideology. It was the furtherance across borders of its reactionary edict that the Jewish state is the source of the world's ills and the Jewish people guilty by association. We had it coming for us, Brendan. Indeed, these hate marches, which continue and continue a year on and into the future, speak of this. Absolutely. That is, that is the consequence of 7th of October in much of the West has been um, the entrenchment of anti-Israel hostility and anti-Jewish hostility. It's such a colossal tragedy, in my view, that so many in the West fail to see the enormity of what happened on 7th of October. Some of them refer to it as resistance, which is just hogwash and an unforgivable um, dressing up of a pogrom as something more worthy and more interesting. But then other people got it wrong as well, even those who said, you know, it was terrorism, it was bad, but but Israel shouldn't have responded in the way that it did. Even they, those kinds of people, fail to appreciate the enormity of what occurred. Because what happened on 7th of October was not just mass murder. It wasn't even just terrorism. It was, it was something that came from the last century. It was something that came from that century of war and extermination. It was the return of the pogrom into a world in which we thought those things were old hat, ancient history, something from the history books. And um, it, it represented one of the most violent rippings at civilization that we have ever witnessed. It was really a uniquely barbarous assault. You know, it wasn't Israel that was uniquely murderous. It was Hamas's pogrom, which was designed expressly to kill Jewish people because they're Jewish people. And the failure of so many in the West to get to grips with that, I just thought was extraordinary. And instead, as you say, there were celebrations. People openly, you know, one of the contributors to Navarra Media on 7th of October itself, she referred to it as a day of celebration. There was a celebration outside the Israeli embassy in London on the 9th of October. This is before Israel fully responded to the attack, by the way. So it wasn't a protest against Israel. It was a celebration of a pogrom. People were dancing and playing music and singing songs. The same thing happened in Sydney. The same thing happened in Berlin. Celebrations of the murder of Jewish people. And a point I make in the book is that this is as wicked and perverse as if people had poured onto the streets to celebrate celebrate Kristallnacht. That's, it's exactly the same thing. And we would remember if people had celebrated Kristallnacht in London. So we should remember that they celebrated the 7th of October. It's so important that we don't forget this. Not to make ourselves depressed at the state of our country, although if people want to feel depressed, I think they have every right to, but just so that we don't let the truth of what happened disappear, so that we don't let it be rewritten. It is so important if we're going to fix our society that we remember what has happened in our society. So the point I the kind of point I arrived at a few months after 7th of October, I was thinking to myself, 
you know, what's going on? I think everyone was thinking, what's going on? We've had celebrations of Hamas. We've had an, a, a, a historic surge in anti-Semitic attacks in Britain and across Europe. What is going on? And, and then slowly I realized that instead of opposing Hamas's pogrom, people in the West were extending Hamas's pogrom. They were enacting a smaller, less violent version of it over here. That's really what was happening. So when that Jewish boy got had stones thrown at him in North London on his way to synagogue, that was an, a, a furtherance of the pogrom. When um, Jewish the kids at the Jewish free school were told that they were allowed to take off their blazers in case they got attacked by bigots on their way to school, that was an extension of the pogrom. And when synagogues were firebombed in Europe and uh, a synagogue was burnt to the ground in Tunisia and Jewish people were assaulted and Jewish gravestones were graffitied. All of this happened after 7th of October. All of it was people in the West saying, right, we're getting our cue from Hamas. We've listened to the Hamas. We're going to do what they're telling us to do, which is to globalize the Intifada. And that slogan was heard everywhere. Globalize the Intifada. People were saying that weeks, days, in fact, after an intifada in which 1,100 Jewish people were slaughtered. And if you're crying globalize the intifada after such an event, we know what that means. And that is sadly what happened. The uh, Jew hate of Hamas was globalized and it has impacted on countries around the world. And on everyday activities like taking our children to school or indeed going to synagogue on a Saturday morning. And you've expressed the pogrom in murder and stone throwing and assault but there's one other thing that we need to express this in rape the sisterhood where is the sisterhood in the me too movement the rape of jewish women seems to have been discarded well if you're a jewish woman well you know it's that's a different kind of rape isn't it it's 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 disgusting i can't bring myself to express a question but you know what i'm trying to say here yeah, it is. Um, no, it, it, that's really all there is to say. It's disgusting. You know, the, uh, I think it's chapter three in my book is called Lying Jews. And it looks at the way in which very quickly after 7th of October, there was this explosion of so-called skepticism, but really denialism about what had happened on 7th of October. People were saying, well, the IDF killed most of the people, which is not true. Um or, you know, women weren't really raped. That's that's war propaganda from Israel. We know that's not true. We know that there is a numerous evidence, loads of reports, loads of evidence to show that women in the south of Israel were sexually assaulted and abused before being murdered by Hamas. It's very clear that that occurred. But there was denialism around it. And as many people pointed out, and I talk about this in the book, it, it really echoed Holocaust denial. You know, Holocaust denial is built on the idea that Jews lie about the extent of their suffering in order to prop up their political power. That is what Holocaust denial represents. And that's exactly what people said about 7th of October. They said the Jews or the Jewish state is exaggerating what happened in order to prop up their war in Gaza, in order to justify their assault on Hamas and then later on Hezbollah. So it it, it was Holocaust denial in, in a new form. But what was really scary is that it... it arose so quickly. Holocaust denial took a couple of decades to come to the surface, but uh, October denialism was happening in days. It was all over the internet and, and it still is. And the worst form it took was in relation to Hamas's crimes of rape. And, you know, for the past few years, the slogan of the Me Too movement, the slogan of the progressive left, the slogan of feminists has been believe women. When women say they were sexually assaulted, you should believe them. Now, I always had a bit, a bit of an issue with that slogan, not because I think we should disbelieve women, of course, but I believe in the idea of innocence until proven guilty and due process and so on. So we do have to be careful that we examine every accusation that is made and come to a just conclusion. But what is most interesting for me is that slogan completely disappeared on the 8th of October, 2023. Everyone stopped saying it. And when it came to the women of Israel, when it came to Jewish women, we didn't believe them and we were encouraged to be sceptical. And as Nicole Lampert has put it, it was me too, unless you're a Jew.
yeah. that's really what it was. And and one of the points I draw out in the book is that something unbelievably shocking happened, which is that we the the progressives of the West went from saying believe women to saying believe fascists. They were essentially saying we don't believe the women of Israel because they're because we know that this is a deceitful people, but we believe Hamas when they say they didn't do it. So they essentially believe the fascist militia that attacked Jews rather than the Jews who were attacked. That was, I think, a low point in modern Western society. It was one of the most grotesque betrayals of womankind we have ever seen. And um, feminism will never recover from this. Now, of course, there are many, many honorable exceptions. There are many feminists especially older feminists, in fact, who haven't been sucked in by the woke nonsense, et cetera, and intersectionality and all that crap. Um, they did stand with the women of Israel and Jewish Women's Aid was, I think, the only domestic violence group in Britain that said something about it. So some feminists did and, and good on them. That's It's wonderful that they did that. But feminism more broadly there's no coming back from this because if you spend years and years um, campaigning around horrible movie producers or Tory politicians who, who put a hand on your knee or um, drunken young men who ask you for on a date or, or, or kiss you when you don't want to be kissed, all those things which have become the bread and butter of feminism over recent years, but you fall silent when a marauding gang of racist misogynists invade a country and butcher women then you are not worthy of the name feminist and you're certainly not worthy of the word progressive so that betrayal of jewish women in israel i think was one of the real low points of the post 7th of october moment indeed feminism may never come back as you say from this tragedy let's talk now about the the gold standard of diplomacy if you are a leading politician uh, let's let's de-escalate Let's appease. Let's have a ceasefire now. The constant talk of appeasement as if preventing so-called escalation, and that's debatable too, is the gold standard. Let's quote John Stuart Mill. I know this is one of your favorite quotes. War is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. The decayed and degraded state of moral and patriotic feeling, which thinks that nothing is worth the war, is much worse a man who has nothing which he is willing to fight for, nothing which he cares more about than he does about his personal safety, is a miserable creature who has no chance of being free unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. That's a there's a Brexity flavour about that as well as <laughs> yeah. Bre Brendan as well, isn't yeah. there? Which, um, I mean, which I know is your position on Brexit. We'll, we'll move on from that discussion. It's certainly my um, position on Brexit as well. And if I might add another quote here to get your uh, comments, Chaviv Retigor, another writer who I have an utmost respect for, he says, when will the Americans and presumably other people in the West understand that their constant fear of escalation, their addiction to the status quo, no matter how bad it is, has become the foundation of our enemy's strategy? Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't put it better myself. And, you know, this whole obsession with de-escalation i find it really weird and creepy in fact because i mean firstly it's so interesting that people only talk about escalation when israel responds so you know when israel um took action against hezbollah with the with the pages attack for example which i thought was one of the most extraordinary acts in the history of warfare um you know people talk about the trojan horse this was a 3000 trojan horses directly in the pockets of israel's enemies it was extraordinary an extraordinary achievement um and then of course uh, israel is now um bombing hezbollah positions in the south of israel and in parts of beirut etc and everyone is saying the same thing oh no israel is escalating the war i'm sorry why was it not escalation when Hezbollah fired missiles at Israel virtually every day since 8th of October 2023? Why was there not escalation when Hezbollah's rockets forced 60,000 Israelis to leave their homes in the north of the country? Why was it not escalation when a Hezbollah rocket killed 12 Druze children in northern Israel three months ago? Unless people don't care about Druze children, perhaps, because I didn't see any leftists 
crying tears over those kids who were killed by a fascist militia. Um, they said virtually nothing about it because it doesn't fit their narrative that Israel is the cause of every problem. So it's always um, it's never escalation when Israel's enemies are attacking Israel, but it is escalation when Israel responds. That's the, that's such a notable hypocrisy in this discussion. And then the thing is, you know, what do people mean when they say Israel should de-escalate? De de what what, and what do people mean when they say the West should stop arming Israel? And what do they mean when they say Israel uh, has a right to defend itself, but not like this, not by going to war, not by taking direct action against Hamas and Hezbollah? I'll tell you what I think they're saying. What I think they're saying is that Israel should just take it on the chin. Israel should relax, right? It's only It was only 1,100 people. It's not a big deal. 7th of October, it's not the end of the world. Don't, you know, don't overreact, chill out, sit back. And fundamentally, what that boils down to is essentially saying that Jews should let themselves be killed. Because when they respond it's to their killing, it's too dangerous. It's too risky. We don't like the look of it. So that's fundamentally, you know, when people are on the streets of London and New York and Berlin and Paris demanding that their governments stop giving weapons to Israel while simultaneously making excuses for Hamas and Hezbollah, they are saying that Israel should be stripped of the means to defend itself from anti-Semitic violence. They are saying that they want to leave Israel wide open to pogroms, wide open to anti uh, to racist attack, wide open to fascistic violence. And it really comes down to a question of how the so-called progressive elites in the West have, they've always had this kind of tension when it comes to Jewish people. So they, over the past few decades, they, they've liked the image of the Jew as victim, right? Hol Holocaust films are very, very popular. They love to watch them. They get a moral kick from watching these sad films, you know, in which Jews are very emaciated and they're in, 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 in death camps and some of them escape and some of them survive. And it, it makes us feel good to watch movies like that. But when they see the image of a Jew who is a 19 year old or 20 year old man or woman, fit as a fiddle, um, with guns, absolutely determined to defend their nation and their people from the attacks of anti-Semites. They and don't quite like good that. looking as well, Brendan. We, we're quite You're right. this generation, aren't we? <laughs> Attractive people, um, <laughs> tanned, you know, and willing to go to war. Yeah. They don't like that. They don't like that one bit. Mm. And the, it, it offends them at a very basic level. You know, they it, it, I see people sharing images of IDF soldiers and they have this extraordinary contempt for them, which cannot be explained by normal political responses. Mm. It is something much more visceral. And I think it does come down to the fact that these kind of people in the West who are in, sadly very influential, they love a Jew who's in agony or on his knees or requiring sympathy from these influential sections of society. But they don't like a Jew who's standing up and aiming his gun at his enemies. So that the undertone of this argument is that Jews should just let all this stuff happen. And I think anyone who genuinely considers himself to be on the side of humanity should absolutely refute that case. It's uh, the hierarchy of grievance which you're touching on there. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees, says yeah. Emiliano Zapata. Should we talk about the kafir? Now, this is something that I've looked at for, for many, many years. It looks so hostile in 2024. I'm on the tube or I'm on the bus and someone walks on and I slightly freeze. Uh, but that's only a 2024 reaction because I remember 40 years ago, when young Jewish kids in the youth movement that I was part of, uh, they wore them because it resembled being at one with the region as a proud Zionist living next to our Arab neighbours. Here we are, we are, um, you know, well-to-do Ashkenazim living in peace, but we want to be agriculturists. We want to go and build the land in Israel. We want to help the, uh, the growing nation. And hey, you know, we, we're going to try falafel. You know, we're going to have a go at that. We're going to do all these things and we're going to wear the kafir, but not now. I mean, the kafir now, and you write, you write so succinctly and so well here, nothing better captures the moral unworldliness of the pro-Palestine set than the fact that their sartorial signifiers of status were likely made, this is the kafir, by hyper-exploited workers 
in the world's largest unfree state made in China, that the scars they put on to show how much they care for Palestine were likely weaved by people who lack fundamental rights of freedom of speech and democratic enfranchisement, poorly paid, maybe even Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. It's a coveting of suffering. And then I remember that Columbia University nonsense where yeah. people, <laughs> the most privileged kids in the world at the poshest university got, um, you know, a Starbucks coffee, a caramel latte together with like a sarni, you know, as though they were cosplaying. It, yeah. it, was, it was repulsive, actually. It's disgusting. And pathetic. it was pathetic. It, it was so horrible. And um, I just knew as soon as I started this book, I knew there had to be a chapter on the kefir. Mm. Um, Firstly, because I thought it might add some comic relief to a very grim subject matter, um, but also because I think it's an important issue to talk about this sartorial signifier of virtue, which is essentially what it's become. I'm like you, whenever I see, well, I'm sure that when you see someone in a kefir, you might feel slightly threatened by them. And that's absolutely, I think, <laughs> a reasonable response. Uh, when I see them, I just think that person's a wanker. I'm yeah. sorry, that's, that's just my instant response. Yeah. I just think... This is someone who is so turbo smug and self-satisfied yeah. that he or she feels the need to demonstrate their fundamental love of Palestine and by extension, their hatred for Israel to everyone all the time, everywhere they go, in every art gallery, every cafe, every tube journey they take. It's, it is it is virtue signaling in its worst form. Yeah. And the irony, of course, as you've just said, and uh, and I make this point in the book, is that um, I think there's only one kefir maker left in the Palestinian territories because they've been put out of business by the factories in China, which are churning out thousands and thousands of these garments to satisfy the insatiable need of the upper middle classes in the West to put one on and show what a wonderful person they are. And... You know, in these textile factories, we know for a fact that thousands of the Uyghur people, an oppressed Muslim minority in China, were forced by the state to work in these kinds of factories. So it's very feasible that these um, scarves are being made by uh, genuinely oppressed Muslims, genuinely brutalized Muslims. So the irony of it is just beyond belief. And I think it's, it really demonstrates the extent to which anti-Israel sentiment, sadly, has become a part of the luxury belief system. You know, there are there is now a class in society and the various authors have made this point that it's very difficult for the upper echelons of society to demonstrate their virtue through what they own. You know, it's difficult to do that these days because wealth has been is shared out more fairly than it used to be. And, and most people own things that they are proud of, unlike in the past. So what these people tend to do is, is to uh, demonstrate their superiority through luxury beliefs rather than luxury goods. So they have all the correct opinions on everything. You know, they are they have the BLM fist in their social media bio. They take the knee they declare their pronouns and they hate Israel. You know, this is the this is the suite of luxury beliefs that sadly holds sway in certain sections of the middle classes in the West. And the thing that I find worrying about that is that it is this kind of very performative position taking, but one that has destructive consequences, because what it whips up is this idea that hating Israel is not only a reasonable position but a good position it marks you out as a morally superior person and people really buy into that notion that in order to have access to the right thinking section of society you need to be israelophobic so i don't like the way in which the kafir classes think they're just showing how virtuous they are but really they are inflaming anti-israel sentiment which so often crosses the line into anti-jewish sentiment and there's one huge design fault in this hierarchy of, um, of victimhood. And that is that the idea is that the Arabs are brown mm. and the Jews are white. And that's a bit of a problem because most Jews, and I hate the color business because yeah. it's a form of education and faith. Any, uh, any enlightened people, whatever, um, kith or kin they are, including Jews. We have uh, black Jews and white Jews. We have even yellow Jews and 
I always remember my grandma telling me, oh, there are Jews in every country of the world. And I couldn't believe it because she was from Newcastle and, <laughs> uh, and, and she came down to Birmingham. But she was right indeed. But uh, the, the, the design fault, of course, is that um, the, the slight majority of Jews living in Israel are from North Africa and from the Arab world, yeah. <laughs> Persia. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the question no one wants to ask is why are they in Israel? They were in Israel because they got booted out of places they'd lived for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So, um, yeah, the you know, white Jews are actually, um, I think, slightly in a minority in Israel and um, a majority are of Middle Eastern or North African heritage. I, like you, I hate the whole colour thing. I don't give a damn what colour people are. Yeah, I, yeah. I've, I've never been interested in that question. I'm one of those old-fashioned people who agrees with Martin Luther King that we should judge people by their character rather than their color. That used to mean you were anti-racist. Now, apparently it makes you racist. I can't keep up with the way in which these things change. Um, but one of the arguments that because the left in, in the West and, and, and sections of the elites in the West, because they are so consumed by the politics of identity, which is obsessed with race, obsessed with skin color, they see everything through that prism. And they view Israel, the Israel-Gaza conflict through that prism. And in their stupid mind, um, Israel is white and therefore bad. Palestine is brown and therefore good. And so they take the side of Palestine and they think it's it's impossible for the Palestinians to be oppressors because they're brown. How can you be an oppressor if you're brown? And they think it makes perfect sense that Israel is the oppressive force because Israel is white, which it isn't. So it's this infantile reading of everything through the kind of this reductionist politics of identity this hyper racial politics and you know it's bad enough that they read the israel gaza conflict in that way but increasingly that's how they view jews here in the west as well they see jews as um white as hyper privileged even more privileged than normal white folk because jew jewish communities are often successful they um in recent years have integrated fairly well. Before that, they were kind of kept at arm's length and put in ghettos, et cetera, as, as everyone knows. Jews tend to be relatively successful in comparison with some other migrant communities. And so they are seen as privileged. Sometimes they're envied. They are viewed in this very contemptuous way by the politics of identity set, by this new, very influential group in the in the elites who view everything through the politics of identity the politics of victimhood the politics of skin color so the way in which jews have come to be branded as hyper white and hyper privileged it really does demonstrate that the driving force of anti-semitism in the west today is actually the supposedly left-leaning politics of identity rather than the old far-right politics of biological racism and it's that turnaround that i find very very concerning Brendan, um, it's such an important voice that you contribute here and finally that you've put it into a tomb, into a book that is very important. And your voice is extremely important because over the last year or so, the voices from non-Jewish people have come perhaps from the perceived right, mm -hmm. from, from Douglas Murray, a great hero for, for Jewish people. Not all Jewish people, somehow this left and right business seems to infiltrate even Jewish thought, but you can go at where the biggest problem of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is from your from your ideological birthplace, should we say, which which was the left. Mm. It's very important what you're what you're doing, your voice. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I hope I hope it is. I hope it makes a, an impact and has some cut through. But yeah, you're right. I I I very much see myself as coming from the left. I mean, I don't know if I'd call myself left wing now, and I don't know if I'd call myself right wing. I, who knows what those things mean anymore? They don't mean anything. You know, it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's it's all been so mixed up and thrown in the air. And as you reminded me earlier, that the last time we spoke, I, I talked about how I didn't leave the left, the left left me, which I know is a cliche, and people, various people have been saying that for decades, but it's true, you know. It, I do feel that that, that very strongly. I think I have the same, pretty much the same views I've always had. I'm pro-free speech. I'm pro-democracy. 
I believe in increasing the wealth and comfort of poorer people and working class people. I believe in economic redistribution. I believe people should be treated fairly at work. And if they're not, they should have the right to go on strike. I believe all these traditional views that were once packaged up as left wing. And now the left doesn't really talk about those things at all. I mean, it will support public sector strikes, which I find quite irritating and annoying and, and not like, you know, the great strikes of old that gave us a weekend or took children out of working up chimneys and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, you know, the left now is completely obsessed with cultural issues. It's obsessed with issues to do with transgenderism and the question of which toilet men who claim to be women are allowed to use and the question of language and being uber politically correct and never saying the wrong thing unless it comes to jewish people in which case you can say whatever the hell you want they've become myopically focused on these non-economic kind of non-political issues and and that's not a left that i want to have anything to do with and they have become as we've discussed very very anti-israel and increasingly in some quarters anti-semitic so that's not an, a movement i want to have anything whatsoever to do with I want to make it clear that there are voices that come from the left which don't have any truck with that nonsense and with that bigotry and in fact are keen and determined to stand with the Jewish people while they're under attack in Western societies and with Israel while it's under attack in the Middle East. And the more voices we have that are liberal and left and right, I don't care what part of the spectrum they come from, the more voices we have making that case, the better. Brendan, after the pogrom, there's a link to buy the book in our episode description. You are truly a righteous among the nations. Thank you very much for stepping up to the plate, not just since October the 7th, but before that as well. Thank you very much for the second time joining me here on Johnny Gould's Jewish State. Thank you so much, Johnny. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Johnny Gould's Jewish State is brought to you with Dangor Education, supported by UK Teremet, promoting philanthropy. Uh, uh.